And going through SEAL training, like no, no one's ever, you can't survive that as an individual. Mm -hmm. You're not, you're not getting through there. I mean, I'm going for, you know, miles and miles and miles of running with a, you know, 400 pound telephone pole on my shoulder. And certainly didn't do that as an individual, you know, miles of paddling and rolling with a 400 pound boat on your head. Like you're, you're not doing that as an individual. You have to figure out how to work as a team. And, and when you really come together as a team is, you know, as crazy as it sounds, you're going through, you may have heard of Hell Week. Hell Week is early sure. on in training, and basically you're awake for an entire week, and you're, you're, crew, you're, you're together with your crew with that boat, you know, fixed to your head for the whole week. And come, come Wednesday with, you know, zero sleep from Sunday until, you know, Friday when you're done. That's rough. You, know, you will fall asleep while running. Like, it's no joke. And it's, I mean, you're running down the beach, and a micro, micro nap kicks in, and, and you'll just fall and bounce off the sand. <laughs> the sand. Uh, and it's crazy. It's a crazy process. They've really got it figured out. But, you know, it's in that moment that when you when you go down is like that weight you know that weight just got distributed you know six ways instead of seven you know and it's your get back up we are the david johnson show bringing the veteran community stories and perspectives so you can design the life that you deserve Thanks for tuning in to The David Johnson Show. Today's discussion is on leadership. Joining us here in the Phoenix studio is John Fussell. Appreciate you flying out, John. No, great to be here. It is impossible to even begin to talk about everything you did in the military, but your 20-year career in the SEAL teams earned you the title of retired Navy SEAL commander. You fought hard and desired to stay in combat leadership roles from some of the earliest deployments right after 9-11, until you attended NPS Naval Postgraduate School in 2011. Above and beyond that, your desire to serve and your desire to lead ultimately put you in leading some of the most elite of the elite in the Navy SEAL community. And then upon retirement, holding chief of staff positions at companies like Wellington Management out of Boston and starting your own company, all while standing by your side, Rachel, while surviving and battling breast cancer. That's an amazing story. And, uh, it's been a busy stretch, but I, I feel like I should be a little bit bigger the way you describe that. So. Yeah, no, you are, trust me. Well, just getting to know you very briefly the past few months, uh, it's been an honor and a pleasure and somebody I could say with conviction that understands leadership from the highest level all the way down to executing it on a team level. It's, it, it's an honor just to be here. Again, thanks for having me. I think this is a cool, really cool vision that you got and uh, hopefully I'm a little value added to it. Well, thank you. So it's always a challenge for me where, where to start the show off because there's, there's so many angles we could go, but uh, humor me and, and, and start it off. Talk to me about Naval Postgraduate School. And for the people that may not know what it is, what is it? Okay, so uh, yeah, Naval Postgraduate School is, like the name says, it's a, it's a graduate school. Um, it's, you can do any degree you want out there. It's, uh, it's um, run by the Navy. All branches can attend. Uh, foreign exchange, foreign officers come over and go through officers and enlisted go through there as well, and uh, you can do you want to do you know a science degree, an MBA. I did defense analysis, and uh, it's a you know the, the programs range from you know a year to two and a half years depending on what you're going to do. It's out in Monterey, California. So you choose that degree program, you graduate with a master's. Yes, that's interesting. So while you were there some of the coursework you did, I mean, you wrote a thesis in, in identifying high growth and, and high personnel or high potential personnel, I should say. Talk to me a little bit about that thesis that you wrote. Yeah, the thesis is really interesting. Uh, I really enjoyed doing that. Uh, the, I think Naval Postgraduate School tends to have a little bit of a chip on its shoulder because people are like, ah, it's a military thing. It's a, it's a rubber stamp. You're going to send everybody's going to graduate. And um, actually, the course load out there is significant. So it's higher than most uh, um, graduate programs wow and everybody's required to do a thesis which if you've gone through the thesis process is uh, no joke thank god my teammates carried me through but um so we you know there was a big retention problem in my in my former community and there still still is at the mid ranks and it's very typical for officers and you know you remember from your time in the military so we decided we really want to focus on that and go just beyond beyond you know what's going on with retention we want to talk about the identification, grooming, and retention of high potentials. Mm. And I was already kind of a, a student of the game. Uh, I'd, I'd really paid attention to this stuff for quite a while. Post 9-11, started watching how it evolved. It was just different post 9-11. And then, but that was the first time for you know, a solid 18 months. We got to roll our sleeves up and really dive Interesting. into it. Yeah. So was that for, I mean, when you're writing thesis statements, I think data, science, research, was that for a lot of it came from your personal experience or were, were there already uh, publications that you could research and find data on that? 
Yeah, no, they held our feet to the fire. We had to do a real thesis. <laughs> so we had to do a lot of research. Wow. We did go out and connect with every company that we could get our hands on to talk to them about, okay, what are you doing for your people? How are you bringing your t- high potentials in? What are you doing to separate them from the pack and let them know that you, you know, care about them? them. So it was, it was a great process. We enjoyed doing it. Because there was a problem of losing that talent in, in the ranks, yeah. the, the experienced folks. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it was, you know, and I, I came in, you know, we talked about our paths. I came in, I came in SEAL teams pre 9-11 and I came in 1995 right after undergraduate school. And, you know, so I was in SEAL teams for a stretch before 9-11 went down. And when top performers moved on, you know, we were bummed to see him go, you know, but we weren't at war. So like, ah, Bob's a great guy. We're going to miss Bob, you know, and Joe's going to do just fine backfilling Bob. Um, post 9-11, it was just the stakes were just higher. We absolutely, it was critical that every one of our A-plus players stayed, and we weren't, we weren't hitting that mark. Do you think the op-tempo of deployments had a little bit to do with people leaving? Certainly, yeah. I mean, some guys, you know, have what it takes to get through the initial SEAL training, which is, you know, more proud of anybody that gets through that program is not, I barely survived it. <laughs> it's, uh, it's no joke. And then you get there, and then there's a very, very small fraction of guys that you know, face the realities of war and like, okay, mm. that's just not for me. And they'll sort of self-select out. That's a very, very tiny number. The, the, mm. the training program kind of vets for that in the first place. And then beyond that, to your point, the, the op tempo, it's a grind, you know, and it's a, it's a motivated, smart bunch of guys and it is a grind. I mean, you know, when I was doing the job, I leaned heavily into the job until they sent, sent me to graduate school and, you know, you sleep and if you're doing the job job, you're, you know, you're home maybe a hundred nights a year, right. you know, and you start doing that for, decades and, wow. and beyond you know it's, it's a grind and you know I mean, wow. we all know you're not making any money yeah. you know and your brother's got a daytime job and, you know working someplace you know making 5x what you're making maybe you know well, well yeah. i'm exaggerating but yeah you know so yeah it's, it's a grind what shift in mentality was that for you to go from that op tempo to constant deployments also being in a command and leadership role and on the ground to mps was that a welcome change um i knew it was time to do it and it was hard. It was hard. I, uh, I think I literally almost got in a fist fight one time with a guy who was in charge of uh, our systems. As, and as you know, there's different levels of classification sure. um, for your emails and what you have access to. And coming from where I was coming from, I had a very, very high level. And it was pretty hard to get that level of access there. But it could be done. Uh, and it was, down in the, it was down in the bowels of this, you know, this, behind multiple locked doors. And just, just a very few of us could actually. And it took a while. And, wow. And I went from having real access to daily reports, intel, reading straight what was coming off the battlefield, watch, you know, wow. watching the news cycle, how far behind the news cycle was, to nothing. And then it took me a couple of months out there to get it back up. And, and, and it was, uh, I, was, I was so kind of addicted to that tempo. But then I kind of realized, like, once I did get access to it, that I, I slowly kind of weaned myself off of it. And I just realized, like, I can, I can actually watch the news and I now I kind of know the gap and what, what's true and what's not. And not to pry, but did you want that level of access out there because you wanted to stay informed or you're still consulting, so to speak, or with the community or what? I was just trying to keep, to keep tabs on what my buddies were doing. I mean, sure. I, the, you know, and I was so used to going in every morning and reading, reading the after action reports and seeing what had just happened. And, and um, yeah, when you really, really have your pulse on the things that's fresh off the battlefield, it's different. And, uh, that's, you know, it's a little addictive knowing you have that level of access. But it was, good, it was a good time to wean myself off of it, though. Wow. We were talking the other day, and you talked about when you made the decision to retire, it was a full-on, dare I say, mission to start planning that retirement. You took it serious. It, it was a very deliberate, you took very deliberate steps. So talk about, so when you made that decision, I'm going to retire, yeah. what, went, what started going through your mind? Yeah, so as... Um, and again, you know the, the military process. So I was an enlisted guy for about five years, and then I got my commission. And I was coming home from my final deployment uh, over to Afghanistan. And uh, I think the detailer, the detailer, the guy who gives you your next set of orders, your next job, he was looking at my paperwork for my time as an officer. So mm-hmm. he saw 12 years. Oh. And, um, and you know, typically mid-career officers are like, hey, we're going to send this guy to graduate school. Um, you know, he'll, he'll go to graduate school for 18 months or 24 months, and then I'll, he'll owe a payback tour. So if you're in for t- your, your 12-year mark, you know, you get 18 months of school, you know, you wake up, you're almost 14, you owe a t- payback tour, boom, next thing you know, you're 16. So that guy's thinking retention. Like, hey, if I send this guy to graduate school, I'll get 20 years out of this guy. He wasn't quite paying attention to the fact that I had five years enlisted time. So I was not at 12. I was at, you know, about 17. And uh, 
And then P.S. Saw, would wrap that up. Saw the writing on the wall, and uh, my wife and I sat down, and you know we'd had two kids talking about having our third. Our son joined us when I was uh, going through grad school. Oh, nice. And we just did a full system check on the family and said, look, we've been through a lot, and um, you know I think it's time to, to 20 will be good. So, and then to your point, it became a mission. Not to veer off, but more power to your family and your wife to stay from that, I mean, even prior to 9-11, but the op tempo from 9-11 to 2011 when you were probably home 100 days a year or whatever have you, that, yeah. that takes a powerful family unit. No, the wives deserve all the credit in the world. That's I mean. amazing. So you made the decision, I'm going to retire. What then steps did you take? I mean, active steps, your mindset, did it start changing? Do I stay in the same industry I'm in now? Do, do I get out? Do I just see what's out there? I mean, how does that even go down for somebody at your level? Well, I mean, you know, I started talking to a lot of great people. I had the opportunity to interact while I was in Naval Postgraduate School. Um, a lot of great supporters there, a lot of Silicon Valley types. Uh, so I met a bunch of great people and started, started, you know, picking people's brains about everything that was out there. And, you know, we, we can talk later maybe about the, the various vets coming out of different milestones. Sure. Um, for a guy who's going to be retiring at 44 years old, I'm like, oh, are we going to go old dog, new tricks? What are we doing here? Or are we going to try to leverage what's already between my ears? And my thought was like, let's leverage what I already bring to the fight because you don't want to put me shoulder to shoulder with some 26-year-old and expect us to like, that. that's silly. you know. So, so I started looking industry, 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 seeing what was out there and where could my abilities be most effectively leveraged. And um, I didn't, I didn't want to go defense contracting world, which nothing against guys. I have buddies that have done that, and that's a great option. It's, it's a very natural progression. So there was no thinking. You, you immediately knew I did not want to go defense contracting. That was just, you just internally Pretty knew. much. And, you know, and, you, know you, you are your last job. And my thought, my thought process was, look, 20 years in the SEAL teams, followed by you know, some time at big defense contractor. And then if I walk out of that, I'm, just kinda, I'm kinda typecasted for life. And I didn't want to do that. I wanted to take on something new and different. So everything, I wasn't, I was kind of industry agnostic, you mm -hmm. know, and I was, but I interviewed all over the place. I did end up um, connecting with some great folks in the finance world. Um, I mean, having never balanced my checkup book in my life, um, I ended up sitting <laughs> on the trading the desk. Yeah, you know, so, but it was great. It was a great transition. And not just the finance world, you went to a top name firm, maybe not top name in the sense that I'm USAA and I'm on a billboard, but top name as in a major player in the field. Yeah, it's an amazing, amazing organization. I was, uh, I was very humbled to be a part of that and get That's my foot awesome. in the door. And uh, super collegial shop. I was, when I was looking at um, various, I mean, from tech to whatever, everything I was looking at, I was looking for people and culture. And I didn't want to go, again, at 44 years old, I didn't want to go hang out someplace with a bunch of sharp elbows who people, you know, people didn't want to, let's, let's not help this guy. And so I wanted to go someplace that was, you know, good people. And that, that shop for certain certainly had that. Wow. So getting into the topic of leadership a little bit and, and, and touching on a few concepts, I've read some articles that, that I've uh, I found online that you've contributed to in Forbes and whatnot, and you, you touch on this aspect of the human component. I mean, briefly talk to me about some leadership traits, roles, if you will, from the military side and then transitioning that into, dare I say, the corporate America side or the civilian side. What are some of the similarities or your first experiences that you've seen? I think, I mean, it's, it's really tough to, you know, a lot of people are like, hey, we want to we wanna touch a little bit of that, what the military has. And it's hard. I mean, if you think about the military, you've got, think about the age demographic, particularly like at the combat level. So it's, you know, at the, the higher end, for, higher end, but the more specialized units, you know, you're starting about 25 years old, sure. you know, for average new SEAL. And, um, but, you know, from 20s, like pro athletics, you know, early 20s to late 30s, all have a common focus. Nobody's making any money. They're all putting the guy to their left and their right before themselves. Like that's that you're not really going to replicate that in uh, corporate America exactly. Um, that's just the reality, and it's not, not a, it's not a shot at anybody. It's not a bad thing, but I think the stuff that does translate is or that you see everywhere is just pe driven people have they, they want leadership. They have a hunger for leadership. Mm. They want leaders who step up and make calls. Who are not afraid to make calls. Who are not afraid to take action. You know, and that really. So yes, I saw that kind of universally, and. Uh, leaders who are paying attention to the energy flow and amongst the team and all that. So I'm, I'm glad you brought up energy flow because I, I, I literally printed out and highlighted this article that I saw <laughs> you, that you wrote uh, and, and you talk about energy. We all know the term energy. We hear the term energy. I think high energy, I get a good night's sleep, I wake up, I, I'm alert, I'm motivated. Translate to me energy as it relates to a leader and what that means and how it, you disseminate that amongst the team. Yeah, I think the um, there's a lot there's a lot to it. So there's no, no real quick short answer on that one. But the you know the leaders that I had the opportunity to you know peer my peers who were leaders who were 
you know, I was blown away by how good they were. And then people that were senior to me that I worked for, uh, the, the, the leaders that I worked with and for that I aspired to be most like were the ones that really had their finger on the pulse of what was going on. They paid attention to the, you know, there's some epic highs and some epic lows when you're going to combat, Mm. you know, and some bad stuff, but it was the leaders that had their finger on that could pay attention and that inspired their people. Not, not like, you know, you know, Henry, Henry the fifth, you know, back into the breach brothers. I'll mess that quote up all day long, but you know, not that sort of, you know, rah, rah type stuff as great as Shakespeare writing that was, but um, it's about, you know, through actions to say the, the leaders who aren't afraid to take action, the leaders who aren't afraid to own decisions, make decisions and stand behind those calls. And, uh, you know, and also like disseminating strategic vision. You know, a lot of leaders, a lot of people think, well, oh, strategic vision, that's for the C-suite. Let them take care of that strategic vision stuff. I'm going to do my job. Mm. You know, it's a scalable, it's a relative term, you know, and it's not about having the, you know, most junior private on the battlefield trying to think like an admiral or a general. That would be bad. <laughs> and, and, and the opposite holds true really well. Don't, if you're, you get stars on your collar, you shouldn't be running around in the tactical weeds. But um, <laughs> it's, it's the leaders who could scale that. Because if I just give you my to-do list, like it's, you're just going to go through the motions. Your energy is going to be blah, you know, uh-huh. you know, but if I can take my to-do list and we can sit down and it can become, you know, a strategic vision for us and you take your piece of it. Now you're, now you've got a strategic goal. So does that, does that go along with getting the team's buy-in? So they kind of want to do it. They know why they're doing it. Yeah. I mean, you know, again, at the, the levels that I was very fortunate enough to be a part of, uh, you had just some driven folks that are, they barely, barely need you there. You know, you're just, you're, it's that final little finest, bit of like getting everybody in the same direction right um i mean the you know the military by design is people people go down you lose people nobody is irreplaceable you know and uh, if something god forbid happened to me or my right hand man somebody right there is going to step up and run with that at, at, at your ranks yes and the units you were in for sure so speaking of that tell me about a time when you were serving that you saw that leadership prevail maybe something that just you, you felt proud of um, so, I mean, I was, again, I was fortunate. My timing was very unique. I got to be a part of a lot of, uh, a lot of pretty amazing things, highs and again, epic highs and epic lows along the way. There was a, a time kind of towards the end of my tactical career. We actually, uh, we got to stand up a brand new mission set in Afghanistan that had never been done before. And, wow. uh, it was a, uh, it was a daytime operation and uh, sort of helicopter based. And we were doing interdictions going out after guys. And, uh, it was, it was unbelievable it was an amazing amazing process the logistics that went into the coordination that went into and the speed with which it unfolded um, everybody knew down to the man what everybody else was thinking and doing and behaving wow. and uh, that that was just hands down it was about a four-month stretch for me that was the most amazing stretch of my career wow and then what i'm hearing is you know it was successful and i've heard you talk about the group versus the team and at that team level, I mean, the leadership at the team level, team level versus the group level, there, there, there's a difference. And you said, you know, things okay. kind of happen at the team level versus yeah. group level. Yeah. What, what does that it's mean? It's a discussion that's kind of come up and, you know, I've been running around the finance world for a little over five years now and I've met with lots of great people and I always get, Hey, come talk to our team. We can come talk to our team. And, uh, I kind of hit a point where I'm like, okay, you're, you're a nice bunch of folks. But you are not a team, <laughs> not even close. And it's not a shot. It's just it's it's truth. Like you are a group, and that's okay. Um, there's, if you look at you, know, you remember the military. If you look at the task organization in the military, there's no shortage of groups. Uh, I've worked for some. I've worked for groups in the military, and they're great, and they can be very high functioning. If you look at the same task organization chart in the military, and you go to the tactical level where the bullets are flying, you're going to find teams, teams, teams. So it's you an know. example. I'm an infantry squad. Here, here's my guys. I, I, that's the team level. Yeah, or a fire. I'm a fire team. I'm a fire team. Fire right. team. You know, and there's a, there's a lot of psychological stuff behind that. You know, we have these social norms of behaviors that we're hardwired to to do. You know, mob mentality is a real thing. I mean, hopefully, no one watching here has flipped over cars after the Bruins won a game. But that happens. Mob mentality. We're you know we're mammals and we do silly stuff. You know, when I tell you you're part of a team, you're pre-wired to think about things differently than if I tell you you're part of a group. So tell me how that team relates then into to the civilian life. And I'll be candid. I, I, I mean, I haven't had a job in 12 years. I've been on my own. So I, awesome. I, I, awesome. I've, never, nice. I've never worked in a, a, a large company. I, right. I've always been on my own. What does team mean to these large companies? Do you have like a, a sales team, a marketing team? I, I honestly don't know what that means. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, you know I, I somewhat kid around about it. Your, your superpower when you're on a team, a real team, is your get back up. And you really, really learn this. You know, I thought I knew 
pretty well what it was to be part of a team. I wrestled from, you know, sixth or seventh grade all the way through college. Mm. And, you know, if you know wrestling teams, it's a pretty scrappy bunch. We had each other's back. I mean, that was my team. And I, and I, knew, I knew those guys would look out for me no matter what. And then you get to the next level and then some, and it just blows that all away. And going through SEAL training, like no, no one's ever – you can't survive that as an individual. Mm. You're, not, you're not getting through there. I mean, I've gone for, you know, miles and miles and miles of running with a, you know – 400 pound telephone pole on my shoulder and I certainly didn't do that as an individual you know miles of paddling and rowing with a 400 pound boat on your head like you're, you're not doing that as an individual you have to figure out how to work as a team and and when you really come together as a team is you know it's crazy as sounds you're going through you may have heard of hell week hell week is early sure. on in training and basically you're awake for an entire week and your your crew you're, you're together with your crew with that boat you know fixed to your head for the whole week and come come Wednesday with you know zero sleep from Sunday until you know Friday when you're done. That's rough. You know you will fall asleep while running. Like it's no joke. And it's, I mean you're running down the beach and a micro micro nap kicks in and, and you'll just fall and bounce off the sand. <laughs> the sand. Uh, it's crazy. It's a crazy process. They've really got it figured out. But you know it's in that moment that when when you go down is like that weight. You know that weight just got distributed. You know six ways instead of seven. You know and it's your get back up. And that's a tough thing to replicate, you know, and plenty of people in corporate America, uh, I'm, I'm envious, you had never stepped foot in there, but um, no, it's great. It's great people. But I mean, plenty of people, there's no shame in like, you know, hey, I'm a business development and I'm a sales guy or whatever. And this has been a rough stretch for me and my numbers aren't where I wish they were this year. And you're coming into, you know, Thanksgiving and, and you're like, you know what, this has been, this has been a rough stretch. I'm just going to take a knee. I'll sort this out come January. You know, mm -hmm. and there's no shame in that. And you probably no people that have done it. Mm -hmm. If you're really part of a team, guarantee you when you think you're going to take a knee come November 15th and chill out for six weeks, you're going to get back up. Interesting. You know, and that's, that's where you got to get to where you really depend on one another. So I read articles and, you know, I've read every Forbes deal and entrepreneur.com deal and mm. they talk about company culture. I mean, is this part of, does a leader set this kind of all company culture to yeah. set this team mentality? Yeah, all day long. Yeah, hand in hand. It's almost synonymous. So I mean, like, hand in hand. And this goes back to what you were saying earlier. I mean, humans have a desire to want to have leadership, right? I mean, you have this team. They, they desire yeah. to want to have a leader. Maybe from an, you know, an internal, just intrinsic value, but then they, teams can function more as a leader, right? Yeah. Fun, teams can function better with the leader, which boosts morale and, and, and productivity all around. Yeah. So... These leaders that can do this, I mean, is this, is this a trait you can learn, do you think? I think, I think there's some, uh, so first of all, I say, you know, when you're putting together your list of your shmees, your subject matter experts that you want to go do something and, um, you know, whatever that is, whatever industry you're in, I need a, I need a business development person and I need a, you know, relationship management person, whatever those subject matter experts are, you, you need to have leadership on there. That's a real, that's it. That's no joke. It's a full-time job. And, and, and the truth is like leadership's a pain in the neck. Um, mm. It's not. You know, the, once you've stepped up and you said, I can, I've, I kind of figured this out. I think I can be beneficial in this realm. I can do it. But you realize it's, you know, it's none of the, uh, you know, if things are going well, you're not getting any of the praise. If things are going south, you're getting all the heat. Like mm -hmm. that's leadership. If the opposite you know, if the opposite rings true in your world and you think you're in a leadership role, you might be thinking, I need to reorganize how I do this. Um, and, you know, to your question, can it be nature versus nurture on leadership? I think there are some attributes that are nice to have if you're going to push someone into a leadership role. That said, it doesn't matter. You, you can learn to lead. You can. You can. So I have, yeah, sure. I mean, uh, if I'm, I'm definitely an extrovert. I mean, it's nice. It's nice to be outgoing. It's nice to be able to communicate. You know, I've worked for one of the best leaders I ever worked for was about as big an introvert as you ever want to meet. Interesting. But he was he was awesome. He was an amazing amazing leader. What was the trait about him that made him that great leader? Uh, just I mean, just such a thoughtful guy. You know, and, and, and gave, you know, was not afraid to give us all the rope and then some to hang ourselves with. And then when, he, when we needed minor course corrections, he was, he was very humble and uh, professional about saying, hey, you might want to factor this in. Wow, that's so. good stuff. So let's fast forward a few years. I mean, present day, but you started a company, uh, yep. Patriot Leadership Development. What was the mindset behind that and what do you do there? So, uh, it's, you know, it, like, many things in my life, it's just kind of organically evolved. Uh, initially, I had some people asking me to come in and speak to companies, and I was actually still active duty right towards the tail end of my career. Oh, wow. And so I had, went and had to talk to the, talk to the Jags, had to talk to the legal, oh, and wow. say, hey, can I go do these talks? They were like, yeah, make sure you don't talk about anything classified and all this stuff and break it out. And so, you know, so I literally set up a small LLC to get things going. Um, that kind of went back burner when I went jumped into the full-time job in, in the finance world. 
And but then within a couple of years in the finance world, it started kind of bubbling up, and I was being asked over and over, "Hey, can you come talk to us about this? Talk to us about that? Talk, you know, we have these high potentials. She's an up and comer. You know, this group's being retasked." So I got I started getting asked more and more, um, both internally at the shop that I was working at, and then to strategic clients, and then 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 outside altogether. And is it more? Um giving talks is it more one-on-one coaching what what's the on when you're actually doing it at the company level what, what are yeah, you doing with it's them? a little bit honestly it's a little bit of all of the above uh-huh. um coming in and meeting meeting with the generally kind of go to big to small meet with a bigger group not not huge groups occasionally i've done big big stuff but you know meeting with a complex meeting with a few dozen folks kind of talking through some thoughts on leadership some things they might because uh, I, I do i still do a lot in the finance world and there's everybody's realizing like a team-based structure is a really smart way to attack problems. And I was so, just about to ask, is it like a foundation that you go in on the team-based structure? Do you have yeah. a couple few leadership pillars that you like exactly. to lead with? Exactly. Kind of come in and talk about, look, this is some stuff you should be doing. And it, again, very well-intended people, but you know, me answering your phone when you're at lunch doesn't make us teammates. <laughs> you know? and, and I mean, that's, you know, so taking it beyond that. And then that, that will typically lead to, for those who, uh, are more interested and get it. They're like, Hey, that, that was great stuff. Could you come back and now work with, we have a team of six of us. Can you actually spend some time with us? And talking about how to be more cohesive and how to, which directly can drive results in the business all day long. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Cause they're more productive, happier per se. Yep. Interesting. So you've done talks. Um, and we briefly talked about this about veterans and, and maybe transitioning veterans and the hiring, mm-hmm. bu- uh, hiring of veterans. Right. And there's different buckets of veterans per yeah, se. Buckets. The buckets. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's a, that could be a whole conversation in yeah. itself, but w- briefly, what are the, what are these buckets? So, I mean, what I've sort of seen in my, uh, just one over five years since I retired and what I sort of identified along the path was, um, you know, there's a lot of well-intended folks. I, I, I got asked to speak at the HR event up in New England a couple of years ago to all HR people who were hiring vets. Mm. And they were nice people, well-intended, but their overall understanding of the military was not where it should have been. And um, what, what I've sort of seen is there's, there's various buckets of individuals that come out of the military. And, uh, and, and skills versus abilities also plays into that. But bucket one, and this is, you know, I know your career path, you came in, did your, did six years? Correct. Use the GI Bill? Absolutely. You know, and so you finished school when you were how old? Uh, I graduated Arizona State in 2010, so I don't know, 28, yeah. 27. Yeah, so you mean 20. you're dead on bucket one. So bucket, <laughs> bucket, bucket one is... Uh, hopefully that's a good bucket. It's a good bucket. I mean, bucket one is someone who comes out, doesn't have an undergraduate degree, does a stretch, uses probably uses the GI Bill, pick up a degree, and then moves on. Hmm. And as, a, as an employer, um, you're hiring that individual. Most companies basically like, hey, look, there's another undergrad, let's hire him. Hmm. Me, anybody who's paying attention, you know, Sorry, undergrads that didn't serve, but if I've got an uh, undergrad who did four or five, six years in the Marine Corps or Army or whatever and used a GI Bill and knocked it out versus someone who came from mom and dad's house is hanging out and knocking out their undergrad, my money's on the vet. Hmm. You know, a little bit older, a little bit more mature, a little bit more professional, hopefully, you know, right. <laughs> a couple of things that maybe the military beaten into that individual. Right. But you're really not getting a leg up. You're still getting hired for the same thing. But in short time, my money says most of the vets are going to outperform the 20, 23 year old, you know, who doesn't, doesn't have their level of professionalism. Do you think a lot of companies think like that? I don't, I know. I don't think so. Uh, and then and again, it's not a shot at them. They're just not, you know, if you really pay attention to they it, don't like, know well, what why, they're why this is more than just checking the block. Like, why do we want this individual? Well, they're a little bit more mature, a little bit, you know. So you tried um, to, so back to the buckets, you tried to break it down of, okay, bucket one, you're the 23, 24, you're out, bucket two, but you tried to break it down to teach these HR and hiring professionals yeah. of what you get from each bucket, what to expect exactly. from the veteran. Yeah, yeah. And so and then just on the same path, bucket two, a lot of young officers will come in and they'll, they'll transition uh-huh. around six, six to 10 years is when they transition. And since they all have an undergraduate degree, there's a lot of MBAs being picked up in route. Mm. So you get young fighter pilot who's flown jets for a few years, moving on, picking up a top notch MBA, boom. And again, companies are really looking at that individual, not a whole lot different than a standard 27 or 28 year old MBA. This guy happens to be, this guy, she happens to be 33. Again, my money's on them. A little mm. bit more mature. They've led, they've, they, you know, they have some, you know, unique abilities that they're bringing to bear. Um, four, uh, bucket three would be me. I think, I don't know if that's really a bucket, but <laughs> bucket three is kind of individuals that have done, call it doing a full career, 20, say 20 to 25 years, um, not retiring as very, very senior folks. I retired as a Lieutenant commander. I, I picked up commander, but I didn't pin it on. So I retired as a Lieutenant commander and, um, th- those individuals, hopefully you're looking to hire someone. Cause now you're talking about someone who's going to be, you know, 40 years old plus, 
hopefully you're hiring them for what is in between their ears already. Hmm. You know, and uh, and the I've seen the experience they have. Yeah, they look this. This I could hire ten MBAs, but this this individual has some unique experience. Was a you know, flew jets or did, you know, did, you know, commanded Marines and did whatever. I'm going to bring them in. Um, and then bucket four, I, I kid around a little bit. And bucket four is really really senior folks, like retired admirals and generals, and um, and they're you know big picture leadership, strategic level leadership stuff that those guys bring to bear is hmm. uh, is very unique. But they're not. They're also you know you're not hiring them to be a worker bee. Probably most of them are be part of a board or things like that so you said something that uh kicked in some thoughts i'm going to put you on the spot for a second we oh, talked about here we go. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you talked about ability and skill mm. and i've heard you say before okay skill set in the military okay i could you know i could fly a plane or i could shoot straight i could pack a parachute i could jump out of it those are skills right, right. so when you got out i mean you went to dare i say a brand new industry that you never were in before yeah but relating this ability to skill conversation back to you, you had the ability to learn new things, so to speak, think on your feet, think under pressure. I mean, that had to directly uh, translate into being able to operate at the level you're operating in today on the outside. Um, I hope so. The verdict, the verdict's still out there. We'll see. The jury's still out on that one. Um, but no, yeah, it's one of the things I sort of also identified over the years is a lot of vets are saying, hey, you know, how do my skills translate? How do my skills translate? And there's lots of great transition companies that are really helping. Like, oh, let's talk about how your, tra- your, your skills transition. And, it, you know, if you're a, you know, the, the folks, folks that don't know the military that well, it's an entire society. I mean, there's plumbers, there's dentists, you name it. Right. And, I mean, if you have a skill set, if you are cranking a wrench on a, an F-18 and you're going to go to Delta and crank wrenches on a jet someplace, that is a skill that is transferring. Mm. Um, the skills associated with my job um, – aren't really as transferable. You mentioned, I, I know how to pack some parachutes and, you know, shoot straight, <laughs> shoot straight. And, you know, <laughs> the, no one's really looking for that outside of certain niche things, which I was kind of staying away from. But what I think is important when you're bringing in folks, you know, is, is saying, well, what, what abilities does this individual have? You know, motivation. Uh, I'd like to think I can communicate pretty effectively with people, you know, up and down the food chain. Uh, I can think on my feet. You know, I can learn stuff relatively quickly. My recent MBA program tested that on me, but mm. uh, I, I survived it. <laughs> but uh, but no, I mean, I like to think I can I can learn pretty quickly and think on my feet and keep my head under pressure. And those are abilities. What so, would you What would you take if you had to pick one? If you're hiring somebody, I, le- I lean towards abilities. Yeah, you and, can that, teach and the skill set exactly. I mean, Excel is a skill. We can all <laughs> we can all just knuckle it out and figure it out eventually, and uh, we'll get there. But um, you know, can this individual think for themselves? And can I can I trust you to be an ambassador, uh, no matter where I send you? And that, that's a big thing. Let's get back into the human part of it. I, I've always been curious about this myself. There's got to be a relation to the human aspect. Of, I mean, some people just are probably not good leaders. Would you agree? I mean, they just maybe don't have it. They haven't developed it yet. And the ones that do have it, you can be an introvert. You can be an extrovert. What more on the human side do you think makes a good leader? Uh, well, a lot of stuff. Uh, I think really just being selfless, you know, and humility. You know, a combat will keep you humble all day long. Mm. You know, there's some big egos. You start working in some of these high-end um, military units. There, there's there's some egos, but the, the guys that have really been there at the pointy end of the spirit out there doing missions, you know, once, you know, once you've lost someone, you know, within feet of you, you're like, you know, you know I'm not Superman. I'm not bulletproof. There's no, there's no reason that I didn't step on that crush wire. Um, and that'll, that'll really keep you humble. And I think the leaders, again, the ones that I, you know, aspired to be more like with the ones that were humble and just, mm. you know, I'm here to serve. I'm here to, I'm here to, you know, shape the battle space so our team can reach its full potential and there's no glory in it, you know, so. And then this is probably a silly question. In my mind, it's, it's relatively obvious. What's the link between leadership and the skill set? Cause you got to be competent at your job yeah. to be, to be in the leadership. I think you, get, you, you, you develop um, a confidence in yourself after, you know, once you've taken on enough challenging things over the years and you realize like I've gone, you know, I'm a pretty avid rock climber. I figured out, done, done some sketchy climbs that scared the heck out of me at times, but I, but I got through it. Hmm. You know, the first time you jump out of an airplane, that's a little nerve wracking, but I figured it out. I got through it. And, and then, you know, whitewater traversing, river crossing, you start doing all these challenging stuff. You start to build up a track record that says, you know, none of this really, you're asking me now to do something that's totally foreign and stepping into this realm of leadership, or, you know, maybe a first time in leadership role, but I have a track record of when you've challenged me to do hard stuff, Somehow it seems to work out, and I get it figured out. So you build, you know, you don't want to get cocky. That'll get you. That'll get you in a lot of trouble. But you start building this confidence in yourself, your in your abilities to take on new challenges. You know that that just popped another thing you said. Actually, we had lunch yesterday, and you were talking about, you know, I'm not going to be that guy that gets out and says, 
you know, suck it up. I'm not getting shot at. And, 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 and you know, this isn't that stressful, but right. there, there are some things, you know, that you're talking about the fear of failure. Don't, don't have that fear of failure. There's no, there's no, there's no sympathy in that realm. Yeah. You know, so I did one of the things I told myself was like, I was never going to be the guy sitting there at the conference room when people were, you know, debating about something that was kind of small potatoes in my opinion. Like I didn't want to be the guy like suck it up. You're not getting shot at. You know, I didn't want to be that guy. And I've tried pretty hard never, never to be that guy. I, I did. I remember I went one time there was a discussion that was kind of, kind of a joke debating what should be done. And I literally had somebody down the table, look down the table at me and, and, and say, you think we look pretty pathetic right now, don't you? And I was like, hey, your word's not mine. I didn't say that. Wow. <laughs> but they, they could see they, the look they read my, it on your they face. They could see the look on my face like, you got to be kidding me. Is this what we're debating right now? Wow. And, uh, but, you know, so, but I never tried to go there, but, you know, and I don't want to minimize, I, I never want to minimize what brings stress into people's lives, you know, and, and if making your quarterly numbers or whatever, that, that's stressful for you and because it's going to impact you. And um, I got it. I know, you know, to each his own. Sure. I, I, t- I tend not to sweat the little stuff too much. I've been through some stuff and I try to mm. keep an even keel on stuff. But the, all that said, if, you know, if what you're afraid of is, is stepping up and on a call, making a decision, taking action, failing, like I got no sympathy for you. Get out of the way. You know? Well, I mean, there's a hard, we talked about the hardcore truth on the employment show earlier that, you know, DD214 doesn't guarantee employment. I mean, there's, no. a, there's also a cold hard truth here. I mean, if you're not going to step up and, and, you're afraid, then you're probably not going to be the leader of the team. I mean, yeah, well, that's just I a mean, fact. You, you, might, you, know, you might end up in a leadership role, yeah. in a leadership position. You're probably never really truly going to be a leader, and, and your people are going to know that. Like if you're, mm. if you're you know, leadership by committee at all times and you know, never you know, hedging yourself so you're never really making a call, so you always have an out if things don't go well, I mean, you yeah. know, unless you're working at a really, really low end company where people aren't paying attention, like your people are paying attention. They see that. They're like, you're this guy's she's not a, she's not wanting to make a yeah. call. He's not wanting to make a call. I've seen that being in the leadership role without being a leader. That's that's a bad recipe. It is really bad. I mean, and you know, it happens, you know. The there's lots of good books out there and what, what got you here won't get you there. People probably read that one. You know, there's lots of lots of organizations say, you know, you know, hey David, you've been crushing it. You're doing X, you know, blah blah blah. Now let's you know You've been the best sales guy for 12 years now. We're going to put you in charge of 40 salespeople. <laughs> you know, and that's during the headlights. You're like, look, I'm really good at this. Right. I'm the top guy. But are you telling me you want me to be in charge of 40 people? That's scary. So it could be a different yeah. skill set. Yeah. And, and, and ability. And exactly. And you can't, you know, the military, um, you know, most of the stereotypes in this world exist because they're kind of tied to some truth. <laughs> the military messes up a lot of stuff, mm. um, especially, uh, you know, we, we're not that efficient with our money, but you know, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so, but I mean, the stereotypes exist for a reason, but one of the things that the military really gets right, in my opinion, is leadership. I mean, they beat it into people's heads. They groom it from the most junior level. Um, you know, hey, you could be the most two junior privates in the Army. Some senior person is going to stick their head in that door and say, hey, look, one of you is senior to the other. Take charge of lead. Take care of this. Mm-hmm. You know, and then, and then there's every milestone. Hey, you were a good fire team leader. We're going to move you up to the next level. Hey, you were a good, you know, troop commander. We're going to move you up to the next level. And grooming guys along the way. You can't just... You can just sprinkle fairy dust at the 18 year mark and think, okay, David, we're going to send you, we're going to send you to an exec ed course for five days and then you'll be a leader. Mm. Like that's, that doesn't work. It's kind of, I, I use the term, you know, I mentor veterans here in Phoenix and I kind of say the, the younger veterans, 20, the bucket one, yep. the me, the, the, the old me's of the world. You know, I read this quote when he was like, knowledge is cumulative, I believe. I mean, what you learn in your teens, what you learn in your twenties, what you learn in your thirties, it just all builds up. So to your point, you take that 18 year old. I mean, so to, to, to that point is leadership kind of cumulative. I mean, you're not. You oh, can't. Absolutely. You can't tell me today at forty, mid forties. You, you just, I just hit fifty. You just hit fifty. Just hit 50. You don't look a day over forty nine. <laughs> but you can't. You, I mean, what you know now, you, right? You didn't know when you were twenty, right? I mean, it, it's cumulative, and you oh, got to build up. It, it builds up. Yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, yeah, it, it, it's all. It's not about like you know. Again, I mentioned I just just uh, survived my the MBA process and amazing process, you know. But it's not about like, hey, I got my MBA and this is what I learned. It's it's a sum of hmm. everything. Hey, this is these are some things that we dove into. This is how it tied into the experiences that I have over my entire adult life. Interesting. And this is how the whole mosaic has changed. So during the MBA process, was it more of an academic? Uh, you learn, I don't want to say facts, but you learn, you know, academia type curriculum, or was it more life and you putting, you know, connecting the dots now, so to speak as well? I wasn't, I mean, it was an intense academic program for sure. I was, I was humbled by the, uh, academic ninja skills of some of my huh. peers. They were <laughs> running circles around me, but, um, I learned a ton, you know, wow. and, um, I learned a ton, but for me, the stuff that was most interesting was one I could say, okay, I've seen, I, I get what you're coming at. You're coming at it from an academic 
standpoint, which is great. And I can see that in my former life and I can see it in my future life. That Those are the things that really interest me. Wow. Well, I might go on a tangent now. And no, okay. there's, there's a question somewhere in here if you, if you bear with me. Because we, <laughs> we were talking yesterday about, you know, integrity and it's a slippery slope, right? Like you make one maybe slip an integrity decision here. What, yeah. What's that going to lead to? Then I'll do it again. Then I'll do it again. Yeah. I, I want to touch on that. But that made me think of something. Was Were, were there key points? And I talk about knowledge is cumulative. Okay, leadership skills might be cumulative. You learn. Was there, were there a couple points in your career or a couple times when you can say my command there or, 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 or that experience there just drastically you took it to the next level and you became a better leader yourself? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And usually those are the really bad, the hard times, you know. Oh. When uh, when something didn't go well, and, mm-hmm. and you know, I, and I was, um, you know, I stood, you know, the term getting called to the carpet. Like I like spent some time on the carpet. You know, there's plenty of times where I stood up like this is the end of my career. I'm done. Uh, but I but wow. I made the decisions that I made for you know what I really believed to be the right reasons. Wow. And I was like, well, if my career ends on this note, then so be it. I'm done. You know, but I, I won't I won't have my career end knowing that I didn't do what I thought was right. And those are the those are the moments where I really learned the most about me and people around me. Did you would you classify those at the time as a failure? Was that a failure you said um, at the moment in the time? Yeah, did you uh, an objective sure. you didn't meet? I mean, just a sure. failure. Yeah, it and could be, yeah. yeah, it could be the failure of a, a whole 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 team of us, or it could be you know one individual, or whatever. But something didn't go well. Well, uh, nothing on, on on your level, but I can relate to that from a personal standpoint. I mean, at twenty eight years old, I was the. 29, whatever, I was a CEO of a $2 million company. It crashed and burned. I made every wrong decision in the book. I had absolutely zero business right. being the CEO of that company. But through that failure, I mean, so I could just yeah, relate to that. I mean, absolutely. Again, nothing on the level you yeah. did, but just from a personal standpoint, I could totally get that because I learned my best lessons and my failures. Yeah. Yeah. And we're, pre- we're pretty good about, you know, driven professionals about when things don't go well, we're pretty good about circling it up and debrief and saying, hey, what did we, where do we mess this up? Where do we drop the ball? What could we have done different? And th- that's great. And we should do that. I think we really learned too from debriefing the stuff that when, when you knock something out of the park, we just want, you know, we're humans. We just want to high five each other and drive on. Mm. Talk about how, what a great job we did. Um, debrief it. Debrief the stuff that went well because you always, there's always something you can do a little bit better. Do you see the teams in, in the corporate America that, that you live in now? Are they doing the AARs, the debriefing, stuff like that? Um, trying to get them to do it. Uh, not, not everybody's doing it. Do they're they, trying to get to do it in a, a smart manner without adding time. Adding, you know, you tell, you walk into corporate America and tell somebody, "Hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put another meeting on your calendar." You're gonna get, you're gonna get run out of there with like pitchforks. So like, some, no one wants more meetings. Some get it and some don't get it. I mean, some just don't understand that value of that feedback and the, the kind of let's huddle afterwards. Once you, once you kind of go through the huddle, uh, the huddle's a good term for it. So yeah. once you go through that process, most people see it and they realize, oh, you're not trying to bog me down with some bureaucratic meeting. Wow. Um, yeah. So yeah. Interesting. So what advice, if, 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 if the veteran getting out on the bucket one or, or, or the bucket three or four like you were in, maybe you could relate to that. What, sure. what, what advice would you give them if you had to? Uh, just, you know, be very aware of, um, you know, what you want to do, you know, be aware of what, what you like doing. Um, I, you know, one of the things I really underestimated was uh, towards the very tail end of my career, right after school, I, I, I wrote a desk for a little stretch. I was the, basically the dean of a schoolhouse for about uh, just shy of two years before I got out and retired. But um, I underestimated how much time I was like, I got a desk job, you know. I underestimated how much time I was not at my desk. I mean, we were out, we were outside. You just, I didn't appreciate how much time I was actually outside doing stuff. Interesting. And when I went to full on like working in a big finance shop and I was behind a desk all day every day, I'm like. I mean, I was kind of like caged animal. Like I was climbing the walls a little bit. I was like, I need you need to get me out of here. That get, sucks. Yeah, you know. <laughs> and uh, so, but I mean, be aware about you know, be, you know, what what do you like doing? Do you, do you want to be outdoors more? Do you want to be indoors? Where do you want to live? That's important too. You know, you can figure out. You can go anywhere you want. And don't be pigeonholed, yeah. like you said. If I had this skill set in the military, I don't have to directly do it on the outside somewhere. Same same yeah. same industry. Yeah. Hmm. Do you miss your time in the military? Do you think about it a lot? Um. You know, probably the same answer you get from most folks that, you know, did the job for a stretch is, um, you know, definitely miss the camaraderie, miss the crew, um, you know, miss, you know, working in a place where, you know, there's just that, that mission, that sense of purpose, that everybody's driving in the same direction. Um, very little political jockeying going on at the tactical level, you yeah, know, people sure. shooting, people shooting at you, you're not, I mean, there's an yeah. occasional, right. but it's very, very, very rare. Um, so I miss that. I miss the, uh, I don't, I don't miss, I been to combat enough times i don't miss i don't need to get shot at anymore got that out of my system and uh, 
I mean, you know, if, if you could send me to a, a six week skydiving trip for training, I'd go do that in a heartbeat right now. So the fun stuff, the shooting, yeah. skydiving and all that stuff, I miss, certainly miss that. But, uh, obviously, and I don't think you compare and you tell me you can't compare, you know, these small teams on the corporate side or civilian side to, to, to anything in the military, but what are a few similarities? I mean, there is, a, there, would you say there is a little camaraderie in some of these teams? Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, like I think as I said earlier, like people with this hunger for leadership and people want it. And I think one of the big things is, you know, military has these massive milestones that just kind of, I mean, you go out on a mission and you accomplish that mission, you know, even, even the analysts who, who deserve all the credit in the world, if it wasn't for the analysts, we'd be just a bunch of over tattooed, muscled up dudes <laughs> walking around in the dark and not knowing where the bad guys were. You know, the analysts got us there and think about the job satisfaction for the analyst who goes, spends you know, 24, yeah. 24 hours, maybe a couple of weeks. And it's like, yeah. this is the Here, guy. Here's your target. <laughs> here's your target. And then we come back with the target that night. Wow. You know what I mean? Like wow. the job satisfaction of that, the sense of purpose of that. And for us going out on the battlefield and do it. So, wow. um, and I think you know, some teams incorporate, you're not going to replicate that, but, um, you know, don't, don't miss the opportunity to acknowledge the, the, the little milestones where some stuff goes on, you know what I mean? Like, Hey, we're not going home tonight till this gets accomplished and everybody rolls their sleeves up and you're staying there till midnight and you get the job done acknowledge that so that, that was my next question what does camaraderie mean in those small teams then in, 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 in the corporate world is that what it means everybody's coming together to, to finish whatever the job is the task is stay late whatever have you is that the camaraderie there yeah, you just have to acknowledge that you know the time mm. we you know we grow tighter with people when we go through the bad stuff the hard stuff you know and going through seal training in no artificial ways whatsoever puts some really bad stuff on you and you are going to bond with that crew for life i mean those are yeah. you know my best friends for life and because yeah. uh, you've gone through some horrific stuff together wow. and, and, and staying to up till midnight to finish a project at work isn't the same as, you know, getting surf tortured or going a week without sleep. And I don't recommend trying to go a week without <laughs> sleep. But um, but again, acknowledge those going through. That. And, and, and I'm, I'm a believer in getting out and doing stuff together, you know, mm. whether it's having lunch every Tuesday or or, or getting out and actually doing a, uh, you know, a corporate offsite or something like do it. That's awesome. So what's next for you? What, what, what's on the what's uh, what's on the horizon? <laughs> um, much to my wife's dismay, we're, uh, I mean, I'm always irons in the fire, just always looking for the next thing. Um, we've recently moved. We're uh, living, living just outside Charlotte and, uh, we love it. It's good. Boston, awesome. Boston was great for a stretch, but, uh, it's yeah. kind of chilly and my wife was over the weather. Yeah. So when we, we got it, we got her healthy. We uh, said, let's get back down South. And, uh, so we're looking at a few things. We're probably uh, going to get a family business, kind of a lifestyle business going for us. And, oh, uh, and I'm going to continue to do what I do. I really enjoy the folks I'm working with. So it's a great opportunity. So that's, so, I mean, business is good and you're going into these firms and you're talking about leadership. Obviously you enjoy that. You're good at it. Yeah. My, my, you know, my main, I've worked with several people, my main client right now, I work with the New York Life Investment Team hmm. and they're a great wow. bunch. And to their credit, I mean, I really like working with them to their credit. They, they get it. They realize like this is, a, you know, I say the whole mind and body approach. And they get it. They're like, look, we're bringing in, bringing in someone who can focus on leadership and help our teams with leadership matters. And so I just genuinely, it's, it's, it's a very light lifting. I, I like what I'm doing. Do you study it anymore? Or are you just going off your, and I say study it, but w w what publications do you read or keep up on? And how do you still stay in the game? Or just, yeah, yeah, I just years. read whatever I get my hands on. Yeah. yeah. You know, there's great stuff out there. Harvard Business Review is always throwing some great stuff out there. And Bloomberg, I mean, you name it. There's, yeah. no, there's no shortage. And once you're kind of in that realm, I'm sure you know the same thing. You know, inevitably, you've got buddies that are looking at the same stuff that are always like, hey, did you catch this one? Did you catch this one? So it's, uh, you know, yeah, you got to keep keep your finger on what's next. That's awesome. Well, John, I can't thank you enough for coming out here. And uh, not that there is, but if there's anything I could ever do to help you out, please don't hesitate to call. I mean, uh, yeah, no, this is great. You, you jumped in on this show. We, we connected about 60 days ago through a mutual buddy. Uh, yeah. Shout out to Tommy Riemann. And I, I told Tommy what I was doing with the show and, and my, you know, this is a passion project and just, to, to deliver different perspectives, stories, and opinions to the veteran community. I'm a huge believer that, you know, you can't really grow, and it sounds crazy, it sounds, you know, 101, but you can't really grow until you hear new experiences and new opinions and stuff like this. Just hopefully we'll, we'll let our community hear new things and different perspectives. Yeah, hopefully. I hopefully think, it's, I think food it's a big for, deal. Food for thought, I hope. Food for so, thought. Well, thank you so much yeah, for coming awesome. out. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate you.